And so I'm excited for today's discussion. This is going to be a little different than we've done in the past in these quarterly reviews. I really want to make this interactive. And so today I'm down at the offices of Technogy, which is an IT services, managed services company that one of our group members owns, two of our group members actually, Shaddy and Sam, they run this organization. They were kind enough to put me up in this room so I could have the call today because we we're just wrapping up meetings at the end of our time. So hopefully the sound will go good and the internet connection solid. Uh, these quarterly online sessions are designed for us to be able to bring more value to our members through their employees by having these quarterly calls where we talk about the content that we're sharing during our group meetings. Um, we found that uh, there's an awful lot of things that leaders would love to do. One of them is train their team and let them know how much they matter to them. But as busy as life is, they don't always get a chance to do that. So these quarterly sessions are our way of investing in your team as part of your uh, leaders membership in our groups. Did everyone get a chance to do their um, satisfaction assessment? Yes. Maybe I should ask it this way. Did anyone not get a chance to do that? Well, I wasn't able to print it out, but I looked at it and knew where to put my marks. Same okay. here. I don't have a printer at home. Well, if for, some, if for some reason you can't, you didn't get a chance to do it, here it is on the screen. And you could go to REFDFW and you could download a blank and then you could uh, fill it out while we're starting our call off today. Uh, at the very least, you could be able to have it in front of you and you could start thinking about the categories in there. Uh, you just go to that page, you'll see it in the full size. You can choose save as, or just print it from there, whatever you wanna do. Um, but this is what we're gonna go through at the start of our call today. And, and to explain these wheels, uh, they're very simple. There's nothing magic about them, but what I try to do is find a series of, of places in life that people have showed me or told me they're frustrated with in their business or in their life. And so we made these wheels. And in the middle is that you're not satisfied at all. And on the outside of the wheels, you're 100% satisfied. So somewhere in between, as the little color example on the right of that page shows, you would have different levels of satisfaction for different areas of your life. And so hopefully those of you got a chance to do that already, uh, filled that out and felt like there were some insights. We're going to go through that in a minute. Um, I think it's important that we look at the personal life as well as the professional life. Uh, none of us uh, are separated from the two as the work day goes on. I just got a text from my family this morning that my mom who fell and she's 90 years old and that she's in rehab and just an update on her. And, you know, it's my mom. So I care about that. So I don't go, Hey, don't bother me during work. You know, you, you should be able to have your life go on because it does go on, even though you're in work mode. So um, hopefully you filled that out and got some insights. Let's, let's continue on. I'll give you a couple minutes for those who are still filling it out. I just wanted to remind you, for those who don't know me or haven't met me before, um, I'm Robert Hunt, and I run groups for CEOs and business owners here in DFW. I've been doing it since 2013. I have the best group members in the world, literally great leaders like Barbie, that you all know. Um, and then, of course, the team Sam and Shaddy here at uh, Technogy IT out in Arlington. And so... Um, my joy is to be able to work with leaders and challenge them to be a best version of themselves. Actually, that's our theme for this year. And so uh, to me, it helps me live out my personal purpose, which is to help people remove obstacles that keep them from being their best. And I get to do it for a job, for a living. So it gives me a lot of joy every day. If you remember, at our, for those who've been on these calls before, uh, the first one we had was in December and it was on trust. We talked about the two aspects of building trust are character and competence. And those are the things that we need to work on as leaders that, you know, to be a friend, uh, someone that trusts, you just need good character. But if you're going to be a leader, you need character and competency because your team's counting on you. We've all worked with really nice, well-meaning people who couldn't get their act together and they didn't deserve our trust. They didn't get our trust. I mean, it was very frustrating. We also work with people who are really good at their job, but they're mean and their character is ugly and you just don't like being with them. So you don't give them trust. You There's a wall that goes up because even though their performance is amazing, they're just they're not the kind of human being you want to give your trust to. So that was the, where we started these series a couple months back in December. And that led to a discussion about accountability. Trust is the foundation for accountability. And if you remember, we talked about the journey of people becoming aware of how things are in a level of accountability in their life. And that as they move beyond excuses and blame and saying, I can't, um, or hoping and waiting that something gets better, they come to a place in their life where they go, nobody cares. 
about my excuses. I need to own this. If I really want the life I want, then I'm going to do something about it. And that's why we named our book, Nobody Cares. And so we are actually, as an update, we're done with that book. We're actually um, ready to go to print. Well, we have it in the bookstores by the second quarter of this year. So if you'd like to order your book ahead of time, you can go to nobodycaresbook.com and you can make a donation to our GoFundMe account and we'll send you an autographed copy of that book as soon as it gets out. That leads me to where we are today. I've been thinking a lot about this idea of having a better version of yourself. That's our theme for 2022. It's a better, a better you in 22. And so, and, and we did these satisfaction assessments with all of our group members, and we're going to spend the whole year looking at different aspects of our life and talking about them. You know, we talk about cash flow, we talk about uh, quality work, we talk about customer service. There's all kinds of things we talk about. Why wouldn't we talk about what it is in our personal life that is also frustrating to us? These are things that we bring to work every day. If you have employees who are really struggling, they're going to come to work with so many worries and cares. They're not going to be as productive as they would be otherwise. And so uh, you being able to understand the needs of your team and you to be self-aware helps you to be able to work on having the better version of yourself. So in these satisfaction assessments that y'all filled out, it's to help you see about what would you like your life to look like? If you put, you're not satisfied somewhere, then you must have a vision of what you want it to look like because it's not there. Therefore, you're not satisfied. And so um, I wanted to talk about this a little bit. When you guys took these assessments and did these wheels, what did you learn from doing the assessment? I need to have more fun. <laughs> more fun, no kidding. <laughs> I need to learn more about uh, sales and marketing and technology. <laughs> yes, yes. Same for me. And everyone on the BCT team and anyone else who's watching is we're all part of sales and marketing. Whether you do actual role of sales or marketing, we live out the brand. We are the people that are continuing to serve in such a way that the customers love us. And when we do our invoices, we do them with excellence. That builds customer service that they feel like we care about them. That is part of the sales process. That's part of having our brand lived out that our customers would never leave us because they love us so much. What else did you learn? Michael has the up the nose camera going on as he drives his car down the road. This will be great if, if a truck, well, it won't be great. It'd be interesting if a truck plows in and we can all see it live on, on television. Be really careful while you're driving, Michael. <laughs> Anybody else learn anything about the level of satisfaction in their life that maybe they hadn't thought about before through this assessment? My life is very full with family and friends. Mm. That's awesome. I think I I, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, I think there's some areas that are a little out of whack, right? Oh, yep. A little imbalanced. And I didn't really realize it until I had to put a dot there. I don't know why it took that, but. <laughs> yeah, like I need to spend more time with family and friends. So maybe that goes into the fun category. <laughs> so yeah, I didn't realize that either. A lot of room for I found that everyone's on so your busy. family and friends. Rachel. <laughs> Say that again because I didn't hear you what you just said. I did, I was just joking with Rachel. I said it depends on her family and friends if oh. she needs to have more time with them. Right. It's right. iffy. <laughs> well, for some people, family and friend is not fun. So you know, I, I get that. Well, the point of this assessment is for you to take a look and say, okay, where in my life am I not satisfied? And now you've really become aware of it. What are you going to do about it? If we were looking at the number of clients or the number of hours billable per person in the field or the, the number of days outstanding on invoices, we'd have a plan to improve it. We'd look at cash flow. We'd look at customer service rankings. We'd, we'd have a plan to work on it. I, I know the BCT team does that you are being intentional towards having the, the excellence in your business that you want. Why wouldn't we do this for all areas of our life? And so today I want you to really think about, and really maybe not think about, maybe give yourself the right to consider what life you really want to have. I think we're so busy so often, we just are putting up with 
the life we have sometimes. And um, I've had clients that have worked themselves into a, a divorce because they've worked so hard and they've neglected the other part of their life. And that's why we do two wheels. If, if I leave my house in the morning and I have a fight with my wife, my whole day is wrecked and I can't feel better until I get back to her and we work it out. <clears throat> What's it like for a person who's got a marriage that's really struggling? Every day they come to work trying to be productive. We just had a discussion this morning in one of our meetings about how come someone's work has dropped off recently. And then someone said, well, didn't they just go through a divorce six months ago? Yeah. Could that be affecting part of that? What our personal life is like is, is definitely carried into our work performance. And the other way around, how things are at work affects how we come back home and, and bring ourselves to our family. I have clients who tell me that at the end of the day, they're so exhausted, they have nothing left to bring the family. That's not the life that they signed up for. That's not the life that most people want. And so as you look at these satisfaction wheels, I'm not telling you, you need to work less hours. Did you hear that, Barbie? I'm not telling them to work less hours. Um, but I am telling you that you need to be intentional about the life you want to have. That's your choice. It's your life. So I want to dive into that a little bit. Um, and I want to really think about when you colored in and you made this decisions about things, what are you going to go do about it? And is there a plan that you'd have towards that? Did, did anybody then after looking at their satisfaction levels, seeing where they're not satisfied, did anyone implement a plan to change that? It would be I'll like us a little, I can talk about that for just a second. Yeah. <clears throat> this is Ashley, by the way, just turn yeah, my Ashley. video on. Um, so, um, I did. I had just kind of looked over this, like just at the beginning of this um, talk here. But um, something just that I we we as a family looked at something similar like this at the beginning of the year, and it was that like we give a hundred a hundred percent, a hundred percent in all these areas. But then it is like my husband and I are the ones that at the end of the day. Um, that's what gets the leftovers. Once the kids, once the work, once the involvement in anything at church, like all those things. And so like, what do we do to change that so that we don't fast forward? We're at that point of like really busy with kids, teenagers and little one. Like, what do you do so that you don't turn around and your marriage is not great? Um, when the kids leave, right? I don't ever right. want to be in that. Um, so what, one of the things that we've done is just literally got a calendar and sat down and said, here's where we're going to go to eat. We're going to go once a month, just us, or, you know what I mean? Like, like deliberately going, and these are the things that we're going to do. Here's other couples that we really both really like. Like, it's not me going, oh, please, let's go, let's go hang out with them. And he's like, oh, that dude, it's so lame. Like, it really is like couples that we both really enjoy their time and that kind of spur us on to where we want to be and just kind of being very deliberate and very intentional about those kind of relationships um, that we're around. So that's a little from us. Perfect. Perfect. Now we'll talk about it a little later on, but before I forget about it, set some KPIs or some measurables that allow you to know when you're off track. If we say we're going to reduce expenses by 10% each quarter, we would go look at the dollars we spend and we'd measure and we'd say, hey, look, we're not cutting enough. What else can we do? Or if we were doing it, we'd celebrate. Look, this is great. We hit that 10 percent next month, next quarter. Let's do it again. We track it. Right. Well, why would we not do that for all the other areas of our life? If I say my health is uh, I'm not happy with my health and yet I keep eating donuts every morning. Go go figure. If I don't block out time to go to the gym, if I don't get enough sleep every night. So these are the things you could measure. Do you set an alarm and agree that every night we're going to go to bed at nine o'clock, no matter what. And then maybe at eight o'clock, it goes off to get you to wind down and get ready for bed. These are proactive measures towards the life you want to have. When we talk about vendor issues or customer service or finances, we make plans to go work on it. And, and those are just as important in our conversation today. If you're not satisfied with some area of the business world, I would assume you guys as a team have agreed to go work on it. Or if you know that your performance is not as good and you can work on it, that's one of your goals you set up for yourself. And the same thing applies for our life. I don't want us to ignore the personal side because it feeds so much into how we, how we work at work. So Ashley, don't, don't forget to set some kind of KPI or some kind of measurable on that. Yeah, thank you for that. 
when we when I talk with people about having satisfaction in their life, the number one reason I get for why they're not doing something about it is they say they don't have time. And I think that that's a very convenient excuse. But the truth is, I have time for everything I want to do. There's just some things I don't want to do more than some other things. And some days I want to keep my job. So I stay late and work. And other days I want to make sure the customers are really happy, even though it's frustrating. So I put up with those. There's things we do because we want something. I just want you to want the other parts of your life just as equally so that they get the attention they deserve. There's this whole thought about a work-life balance. I'm sure you've all heard that term before. How many people here think they have a great work-life balance? Great, a couple people. Awesome. I don't really think there's such a term as work-life balance anymore. I think there's a term of work-life integration. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go through. But um, in our last session on accountability, we talked about saying I can't or using excuses for things isn't really owning the equation. If we want the life we wanna have, we're gonna to have to be intentional to do something about it and making excuses for why we can't have the life we want or the relationships we want, that's really just holding us back as a prisoner. And that's really not accountability. So if we're gonna find satisfaction in both sides of our life, we've gotta be intentional about what we do. So if we could look at the math of the old days and, and for you younger kids out there, when I was younger and I started my career, you went home at the end of the day and that was it. You didn't take a computer home. Nobody called you. You didn't sit there and check emails at night. Nobody paid you. This, this was even before pagers. And so we actually had a life back then. So you do eight hours of work. You could have eight hours of personal life. And then you could get eight hours of sleep. But today, that 24-hour work-life balancing just doesn't work. Because in reality, most of us work way more than eight hours. I mean, physically are working more than eight hours. And if you have to go somewhere, you could put a couple hour drive into that. So maybe it's 10 to 12 hours work. So that's got to go somewhere. That math, you just got to make up those hours out of somewhere. So what do we do? We cut into our personal life. Remember, personal life includes eating food and taking a shower and, you know, doing all the stuff you got to do to keep your own life, like grocery shopping and laundry and things like that. So what do we do to compromise to meet that? We get less sleep. Now we're exhausted, overwhelmed and burned out. Now I bring that to work every day. That's not that's not ideal. We're not being productive to the level we could be because we've abused that kind of concept of somewhere where we can have a balance or a time to cut out. And back to the idea about a work-life balance, it's not like you just section off a part of your life and say, hey, eight hours personal life and then eight hours of work. It's not a pie. It's more like a, a teeter-totter. There are some days where you put in a ton of hours and then there's other days where you put in a bunch of personal stuff. And I, I explained earlier that my mom's in the hospital and recovering. Well, those days when we first heard about that, she's back in California, we weren't super productive because we kept getting phone calls and text messages and trying to find a home for her to go to where she could go and get rehab. So there's days where no business got done, but we took care of life and that was very important. So it's kind of the teeter-totter thing, right? And so if, if we can be um, healthy in one side, you go down on this, the energy that lifts the other side. So I want you to think that by being healthy in your personal life, it actually fuels your productivity in your work life. And if you enjoy your work and you're being productive and you're doing things in an effective way, that leaves you, leaves you go home with energy of the day, which fuels your personal life again. They go back and forth. When one of them's off, if you get off the teeter-totter, it's not going anywhere. We've got to have a balance in that to be able to keep the energy going. And the better my personal life is, the more satisfied my personal life is, the more energy I bring to my work. You ever showed up in a meeting, you were physically there, but your brain was somewhere else? Maybe not even your brain, maybe just your heart. Maybe you're just sitting there, you're, you're sharp, you're thinking, but you're thinking, I hate this guy. <laughs> you sit across the table with a customer and you just want to choke them, but you can't. I know that's a BCT rule. No choking of clients. Um, but you, we can't measure our energy. We can measure how many hours we do stuff, and that's an indicator of what our energy might be. But if we're purposely draining ourselves, we're just not going to have it. 
So I just want you to think about the benefits of investing 100% at wherever you're at. If you're at work, do it 100%. Be, bring your best game to there. And if you're at home, be 100% at home. Leave your phone alone. Whatever rules you need to incorporate to let you be 100% at home. You don't think your kids notice it, but if you're on your phone the whole time while they're telling you a story and you don't respond with intrigue or joy, they sense that you're not listening. We think we're getting away with it. Oh, huh, yeah, really? You had a, you saw a puppy, huh? Okay, yeah. And you're just checking your phone the whole time. Oh, really? A puppy, huh? So not only did you not get the energy from that relationship, doesn't a little child in a conversation with them just feed your soul? And then that brings you back to the work where you got the energy to build the work and that if they feed off of each other. So I want to be able to encourage you to think about what would it look like for me to put the same effort into my personal life as I do at work? And what intentional things would I do to build satisfaction in my personal life? Because I believe it will feed your productivity at work. I think the better you are as a human being, the better you show up at work. And this is something you want to encourage all the people who work on your team, the people who work remote out at the customer's offices. How do they understand that we just don't want to exhaust them and burn them out? We want them to stay long term. We want them to be whole people where they bring their A game to work. What do you think about this concept? A good concept, without a doubt. Nail on head, yes. Say that again? I said nail on head. <laughs> it's a nail on the head. <laughs> it's a nail on the head. <laughs> nothing you, there's nothing you've said that I don't agree with. <laughs> I think that the phone thing is so important. Um, and I see it on all sides. Like my mom and dad are in their sixties and they've made a rule that like, you know, when it comes to family meals, everybody puts their phones up. Um, and I love that, that they just, as the grandparents and parents of adult children just say, guys, no phones here out. Um, and I think that that's to set rules. You've kind of got to be verbal and you kind of got to be a little bit ballsy about that kind of stuff, but you just got to be really clear. I lead a small group with um, freshman girls at our church, and we have a we have a policy: all phones go in the middle of the table. So I think it's one of those ongoing things. And then you see what it's doing to little bitty kids, little bitties that are just they're handed a phone at a meal and they don't know how to order for themselves and have conversations. So I think it's I think it's really key what you hit on, Robert. <clears throat> Robert, I come from way back. And uh, I remember too, when you didn't have cell phones and uh, you, you're right on track. It, we're gonna have our retreat in April uh, for our, my group members. And we're gonna talk about the concept of margin. And if you are, margin is a difference between load and limit. And so a truck carries a certain load and when it gets past the load bearing it, it fails, right? So there's a limit for everything. You have limits too. You just usually see them as you blow by them at 100 miles an hour and you look in the rear view mirror and go, oh, that was my limit. And by the time you think you've hit your limit, you've actually passed it, but you don't recognize it until you're saying, man, I think I'm getting burned out. Oh, no, you are. You are. You just now realize it. But the damage is done. And so we're going to talk about that more in creating margin in our lives. I'll say this a bunch of times because it's so important. I'm not saying that you are bad for working or investing in your career. I'm saying that the other part of your life deserves the same kind of intentionality as your work does. And if you're rating yourself on your performance as a human being, that's what that satisfaction wheel was about. You see areas to improve on. We just have to be intentional. <clears throat> one of the best ways to have work-life integration is to have one version of yourself. If I'm one way at work and I'm another way at home, it, it doesn't build for the ability to seamlessly pop in and out of the worlds I have. If I'm at the office and I feel like I gotta, I gotta show up and be a tyrant, otherwise people won't do their work, it stresses me. It builds this kind of anxiousness inside of me because I have to amp up to yell at people or treat them in the way that I figured in my mind I need to behave. And then I try and bring that attitude home. How's that work? My wife has told me many times, I do not work for you. <laughs> And now, of course, she quit her job and she does work for me, but that's not the point. That There was a lot of times where I would take that attitude home and she would just go, oh, no, oh, no. And so I had to learn many years ago that I, I can't take my aggression and drive and treat other people that way. So why even do it? Look, if the only reason you can get your work done is because you turn into a jerk, you're doing something wrong. 
And so at home, if I'm just this lazy, not contributing, taking advantage of everything slouch, I wouldn't get away with that at work. What makes you think I can get away with it at home? So we've got to have this mindset that we're bringing the best version of ourselves into both parts of our lives. One person can flip back and forth through those things seamlessly. I like this phrase. Oh, that's a scary sound. <clears throat> I like this phrase. It says, no one ever laid on their deathbed and wished they worked more hours. And so I want you to be intentional about your life. I think your family deserves a whole person at home with them as much as your work deserves someone who's got joy and contentment from their home life that they bring to the office. Mm. So some people would argue they just can't do it. And the word can't is like a limitation. We talked about this in accountability. When you say I can't, that's really not true. It's that you don't want to, or you haven't figured out a way to do it, or it's not a priority compared to other things. If you really, really want something, you can make it happen. A few years ago, I think I shared this story when I did the session on accountability. Kathy and I realized that we're just not where we should be in our lives. And the only way to fix it was to sell our house and start over. So at the end of 2019, we decided to sell our home, our beautiful big home with a movie theater upstairs and all this wonderful stuff. And we decided to downsize. We sold all the furniture because where we were going to go rent would never house the furniture we had. And uh, we started over, paid off all of our bills, had no debt by April 2020 when COVID was in full swing. But we didn't have to stress because if I didn't have any money, it didn't matter because I didn't have any debt. And I was living in a little house that was a rental and we had no expenses. We cut everything, all of our memberships, all of our stuff. It was so cool. It was so freeing. And what it did for me is it fixed my brain. I'd become so beat down that I could never be successful in my career that I started to believe it because the, the dollars in my business weren't generating the kind of life I thought I deserved. I thought I would never be successful. I kind of sabotaged myself. My, my psyche was, was broken. But by starting over and selling our house, we freed ourselves of all that stress and pressure and life was very calm at that point. So I tell you this to say, don't tell me you can't do something. You might say, I don't want to. Well, then fine, then be satisfied with where you are. But if you said in that wheel, I'm not satisfied with something, do something about it. Here's a guy, you might have heard of him years ago, Mohammed El Arian. He was the CEO of PIMCO, a large investment firm, very big multi-billions of dollars, international company. He quit his job after his 10-year-old daughter wrote him about all the special moments that he had missed in her life. There were 22 milestones that she wrote out that he had not been there for her. So in 2011, he stopped, he quit a $100 million a year job. Now, a lot of you would say, well, if I made $100 million a year, I could probably quit too because I'd be okay for the rest of my life. But probably not. If you got a $100 million paycheck, you probably have a $100 million spend somewhere. That's America, right? But he made the choice to be intentional about the life he wanted to have and step down from a hugely successful career to be there for his daughter. And I'm not saying that anyone needs to quit their job in order to love their family. I'm just saying, don't tell us, don't say to yourself, I can't, or that would be too hard, or this would, not, this would never work out. Everything that you want to do can be achieved if you're willing to work hard at it enough, if you're willing to make serious changes. In our business, we do that, but I want to also encourage you to do that in your personal life. So when you look at those areas of your life that you're not satisfied with, what are you really willing to do today? to make the change that will give you satisfaction. And maybe it's just an incremental change. Maybe you go from a four to a six by doing this or that. Maybe it's not a huge difference, but you're intentional about something. If you don't spend enough time having fun, and if once a week you found a friend that you like hanging out with and you squeeze in a breakfast, lunch, or dinner with them, it doesn't have to be a big deal. It's just laughing with a friend and doing something intentional. Instead of watching two hours of television, Go for a bike ride, 
or go out and meet some friends and play a game. I don't know. You guys are smart enough to figure it out. The point is that if you say there's something you're not satisfied with, what are you willing to do? This is my personal purpose. And I'm sharing you this because I think purpose is the start of the life that you want to have. I realized years ago that my personal purpose is to help people remove obstacles that keep them from being their best. And the job I chose, I get paid to do that. It's hilarious. I love my job every day because I'm helping people remove obstacles that keep them from being their best. And so you have to decide what your life looks like based on the purpose that you have. Everything that we do that is successful is driven by something. And for me, it all starts with purpose. Look at this screen. It says purpose creates a vision of the future that you want to have, which builds a passion inside of you that causes you to act intentionally. And when you're acting intentionally, you actually end up having discipline that you never had before. So if you're saying, I've been trying to change this or get this done, it's probably because you don't have any purpose behind it. It's a should goal versus a want goal. I should do this. I should, I should save more money. I should get more sleep. When you actually move it to a want goal, you're more likely to get it done. I want to have better friendships. I want to have deeper friendships. So I'm going to speak honestly instead of holding in all my feelings and my frustrations. So the, the, the path towards getting things done, like improving the satisfaction level in various areas of your life, really start with purpose. I learned about purpose by reading a book by Cheryl Batchelder. If, you are, if you've never defined your personal purpose, I recommend you buy this book by Cheryl Batchelder called Dare to Serve Leadership. It's, uh, Cheryl was the CEO of Popeye's Chicken, and she turned it around. I mean, as bad as Popeye's is now, it was really bad before uh, and uh, Cheryl went in and taught servant leader principles. That's the only reason she took the job was that the people who were on the board agreed to let her lead the company following servant leadership principles. And she outlines these in her book and they're really good. But this, the last half of the book gives you step-by-step -step processes for defining your purpose. And that's how I came up to get mine. So I encourage you to go read that book and see if you can define your purpose. That purpose is what's going to create a vision for you. That vision for your marriage, your health, your life, your finances. People who work for your company who are struggling financially will take a job somewhere else just to make minimum payments on a credit card. If we want to keep great employees, we should be just as interested on how they manage their finances as how they manage our customers. Because if they're so broke that they got to take another job, we're not helping them. And if they show up every day stressed out and putting up with crap because they can't afford to lose their job, they would become bitter and you can tell their attitude suffers. So if we can do things to help our employees have healthy marriages, have good friendships, maintain healthy finances, be healthy, they're going to bring their A game back to work. If we just say that's their story, let them deal with it. We're going to get what we get. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you, Ashley. I see the double thumbs up from you. This says the number of hours you put in at work will not necessarily break your work, or I, maybe I should read it. The number of hours you put in at work will not always make or break your success at work. However, the number of hours you put in your personal life will. And so if you're not, satisfied with your life and you're not doing anything about it, you're going to be talking to me a year later from now, still not satisfied with your life. My purpose behind this is because our groups are really focused on having the life they want to have, working intentionally in the different areas of their life that they're not satisfied with. That's why I wanted to bring this to you. You got a whole year that the leader of your company is going to be going through this type of thinking and looking at their business as well as their personal life. We've already talked about spouses and romance. This month, we're talking about health. And we're going to go into all different types of areas of our life to help each other be the best version of ourselves. And I want that for you, too. So you have to think about what you want to do and be willing to, to try it. One of the things that uh, I recommend, another book is a book by Charles, Andy Stanley called Choosing to Cheat. 
in this book, he talks about in life, you're either choosing to cheat your work or you're choosing to cheat your family. It's a constant battle, but we make trade-offs all the time. I'm going to take the kids to the park tonight, but then a client comes up, calls up at five o'clock and says they need this thing. And you say, hey, kids, we're not going to the park tonight. I got to take care of this and work late. That happens. I get it. But then there's also times where you tell the company, hey, I can't come to that planning meeting because my kids got a soccer game today and I'm going to go watch them. And we cheat one or the other. It's a constant effort. But if you're intentional and you find out what the people around you care about, you can put in something Andy calls non-negotiables into your life. My wife loves it when we sit and talk. Now, I'm a guy. And by the time I get home, I've used up all my words. Some days before I even go home, I've used up all my words. My wife has 10 times as many words as I do. And I talk a lot. So by the time I get home, she just want to talk about all this stuff. Man, I just don't want to talk. But I love my wife more than anything else. And so I have found that that is gold to her. That I don't listen to her talk while I check my phone or while I clean the garage. I'm actually looking at her intently at her beautiful face and letting her know that no one in this world matters more than her. I have found a non-negotiable that matters a lot to my wife. What's a non-negotiable for your kid? What's a non-negotiable for your spouse? What's a non-negotiable for a friend? If you constantly bail on your friends because you get busy and you say you're going to do something you cancel all the time, man, that, that makes the kind of friends that don't want to call you to go out anymore. You have to have non-negotiables in your friendships too. What's a non-negotiable in your health? Could we turn our phones off and rest and go to sleep early? I want you to think about some non-negotiables that you could apply for 30 days, just 30 days. If you did all this stuff, do you think the company's going to implode? No, it's going to go on just fine if you worked half an hour less that day. If you took a break at lunch and actually went to lunch and didn't eat lunch at your desk, but actually went to lunch with a friend and laughed and enjoyed life, or maybe ran to the gym and did a half an hour of cardio and came back all smelly, which would be fine. But you're able to do intentionally more than you give yourself credit for if you're willing to do it. So for 30 days, make a commitment to do a trial and tell the team, look, for 30 days, I'm going to eat my lunch out. I won't be here. And for 30 days, I'm going to come in at this time and I'm going to leave at this time just for 30 days. And then do the same thing with other areas of your life. For 30 days, I'm not going to watch TV. Oh, my gosh. What'd that be like? I didn't have a TV for a long time when I was, uh, before I married Kathy, I got divorced and I put the TV in the closet because I remember sitting there watching TV at one in the morning thinking, I'm such a loser. I'm going to be watching TV till one in the morning all by myself the rest of my life. So I put the TV in the closet and for years I never had one. And uh, then I married Kathy and then we had a baby and so she wanted a TV. And so we brought it back out. But I had a lot of hours in those days when I didn't watch TV. What if you just said for 30 days, I'm not going to watch any TV. I'm not against TV. I love being cabin builders. But you could use for 30 days to try some exercises that are going to move intentionally to make that satisfaction a little higher in some areas. Don't spend money for 30 days and see how much more money you pocket away. Read a book, do something. Don't tell me you're too busy and you can't. Those are our victim words. As we learned in our last session on accountability, you get to live whatever life you want to live. I guarantee you, Barbie is concerned about your health as a human being, as well as she is concerned about the company numbers. She genuinely cares about you guys. So I don't think anything's going to implode for you focusing on good, healthy habits for 30 days. Let the people around you know that, that you're working on it so they can support you and encourage you in the process. And then look after 30 days and go, you know, maybe there's another thing I'm going to do for 30 days. Maybe they stay permanent in those areas. Maybe you just go back, but you do something else. What do you think about that idea of a 30-day trial? Like it. What, what would be one area you're going to do for 30 days? What's an area you're going to trial? I'm going to start doing 30-minute walks every night with my kiddos and dogs and stuff. Spend family time, just go out and away from the TVs and all that. My wife has this little deck of cards that ask questions. And you could, you could pose a question as you walk along so that they're not on their phones. You know, yeah. leave the phones at home and, and ask a question. If you could be a superhero, what would you be and why? You know, yeah. and, you know, have conversations as you walk the dogs and make that even richer. Great. Who else? I wrote down um, 
I got this idea from the other Ashley. So thank you, Ashley, for this idea. Um, I wrote down plan ahead a, a date night every other week. Um, Wednesday nights, go to the park with my kids. Um, try the 9 p.m. bedtime during the week. That's really hard for me, <laughs> but I need to sleep. And then um, I used to wake up every morning at 5 a.m. and do my devotionals and read my Bible. I've gotten away from that, so I want to go back to doing that. Awesome. If I cut out TV and I don't watch it, I will go to bed earlier. I'll probably be less amped up by the time I get to bed. and I'll probably sleep better. But all the bad food I eat is on the couch. So I'll probably lose weight because I'm not sitting there mowing through a giant bowl of chips while I watch some TV show. So not only am I going to get more sleep, I'm going to feel better and I'm going to probably lose weight as a result of it. So all these things are connected. But you being intentional to do something feeds so many other areas of your life. Kathy and I have a general rule, but we don't always follow it. But we like to go to bed in each other's arms. It's not always nookie time, but sometimes it's just knowing that my beautiful wife loves me and I get to have my arm around her. And sometimes if I'm watching TV, she'll fall asleep and I miss that. So if I really want that, and that's one of our rules, I have to have an alarm go off that says, go to bed. Go to bed with your wife. Enjoy this beautiful wife. Um, we recently, I like the idea of like family games and like playing games as a family. And so we've bought a lot of games through the years, but like when they go on for like 45 minutes, you're sometimes you're just like, oh, I can't do family game night. So um, we bought some games that like you can do for 10 minutes, like they're oh, 10 minutes. And like great. the kids love it because it's not some long drawn out thing that my husband's like, oh, we've got to play that game that goes on forever. Or I'm yeah. not, or a puzzle that like drags out but they're like quick wins, like really quick, intentional. Let's all go, let's all get around the kitchen table and play this for 10 minutes. Um, and it just shortens that and it makes that where that can happen more often versus once a month family game nights. Now it's twice a week, these quick little things. So that has been a win for us lately. <clears throat> That's cool. I'd love to get a list of those short games. Yep, I absolutely can do that. And you can change the rules to shorten them too. <laughs> that's cool remember to ask the people that you love what matters to them uh, there's a thing called love languages that we tend to do the things that say love to us to other people but it may not say love to them and so ask those people if you want to do something fun what is fun to you and it may be a 10 minute game and that's all you may be doing some really complicated thing that just exhausts you. And the kids are like, this is no fun. So asking your spouse and your friends and your kids, what matters to them? What would speak love to you? What, what tells you I love you? It could be that you read a book when they go to bed or it could just be giving them a kiss goodnight. And if you don't ask, you won't know. And then you'll be working hard on something. That What's that? I should probably ask. I should probably ask because I hate puzzles and long games, but my husband loves Monopoly. So in my mind, it's a win. And he's probably like, I just wish we could play Monopoly. All right. Then, then once in a while, you agree to play Monopoly, you know, just once in a while. And you open a bottle of wine. It makes it a lot more fun. You'd be willing to sell your properties a lot easier that way. Cool. Well, this is my, my passion behind this call. I know it's not rocket science. I'm hoping that satisfaction assessment will get you to really think about what is, it, what is it you want your life to look like. Certainly, all you are working on very hard measurables to deliver results for the company. But I want you to do the same thing for your personal life so you bring more energy to your work. Set some KPIs for your personal life. Track and measure things just like you do for your business. Have some warning signs. Actually, I used to, uh, I have something called my spiritual KPIs that I learned that if I did something and if I stopped doing something, I would sense it. I'd see a, a disturbance in my heart and my attitude and I would miss yeah. that. And so I started doing leading indicators of what would generate the result I'm looking for. And those are the things I do because I know they feed my soul. I don't have to read the Bible, but I know that when I spend time with God before I start my day, I'm grounded in the reality that I am loved by the God of the universe. That's very empowering as I get ready to go out the door and deal with people. So I don't do it out of obligation. I do it because it feeds my soul. And so when you look at those leading indicators of what makes a movement in the needle in your life, know what those things are and invest in them intentionally. 
in the friendships and the relationships you have. This 30-day trial, I think, will be a kickoff for you being able to have what I would hope to be is the better version of your life. Any other questions or we're going to